Once upon a time, long ago, a landowner who owned thousands of acres planted a vineyard. He dug up the ground, cleared the stones, built a wall, dug the pit for a wine press, built a tower, planted it with the choicest of vines. Then he rented it to a couple handfuls of farmers, tenants. And then he went on a long journey. After about three years, the vineyard began to grow the first clusters of grapes. And so the landowner sent a servant to the vineyard to tell the farmers renting the land. The harvest is full. Pay me in wine. He wasn't Wesleyan. Pay me <laughs> in wine the rent that you owe for the vineyard. But even though the harvest was bountiful and the wine was the best and there was plenty of it, they beat the servant up and sent him away empty handed. He went back to the landowner and when the landowner heard it, he tried again. He sent a second servant, this one more prepared than the first to collect his rent for the land. And this time when the farmers saw him coming, they jumped him and they hit him in the head with a club and they threatened him that if he ever came back, they would kill him and they sent him back to the landowner. And the landowner heard this and instead of getting angry, he tried one more time. This time he sent a servant wearing all of the vestments of power and authority of the landowner. And when the farmers saw him coming, they jumped him and they killed him. And he never returned. And when the landowner heard this, he grieved for seven days. And then he got angry. He thought to himself, what will I do? What do we normally do? For this, this actually happened from time to time in that day. There was a law in Israel that said if farmers or tenants who were renting the land worked the land for three consecutive years without hearing from the landowner, they could own the land squatter's rights. This was year three. Everything was on the line. And the landowner knew then that what they had done was not only murder, it was insurrection against his own authority. And it was an attempt to steal his vineyard. But he collected himself and said, there is still one more I could send. My son, whom I love very much, surely they will respect him. And when the farmers saw the son coming, they said to themselves, this is his heir. If we kill him, we will own the vineyard. And so they jumped him. They dragged him outside of the vineyard and they killed him there. And they left his body for the wild animals. Unthinkable in that time. Word got back to the landowner and he grieved for seven days. And then he said to himself, what will I do? Well, what should he do?
he said to himself, I will seize control of my vineyard. I will kill every last one of those farmers. And I will give my vineyard to somebody else. When Jesus first told that story, and he was the first to tell it, it's in Matthew 21, Mark 12, Luke 20, if you keep notes. The audience stood, I think, as silent as you are stand or sitting now. They were trying to put the pieces together. What did he mean? Who were the farmers and what was the vineyard? Why did the story end so badly? The rest of his stories never did. But there was a group of priests and lawyers over to the side. The priests and the lawyers are always over to the side. And they knew exactly who he meant. They knew exactly what he was talking about. And you have to ask yourself, how did they know so quickly? How did their temperament change from, we don't like this guy, to we're going to kill this guy? For they started plotting that very day to arrest him. And you're wondering, how could it have changed so quickly? There must be a history to this. Well, it turns out there is a rich history to this. Upon further investigation, Israel had a long and storied history of seeing itself as a vineyard. As far back as eight or nine hundred years before Christ, the psalmist described the Exodus as a planting. In Psalm 80, verses eight and nine, the psalmist said, you transplanted us like a vine out of Egypt into the promised land. It's a striking imagery when you consider all of the other images that were available. What the psalmist is saying is that the exodus was not just a departure, it was the planting of a vineyard. Israel would see itself as a vineyard. Prophet Jeremiah said, God planted us like a vine. Ezekiel said, we were a vine in God's vineyard with its leaves spreading out and covering the mountains with shade and the boughs reaching out over the oceans. Hosea said, when God found us in the desert, it was like finding grapes in the desert. <laughs> so they had vineyards or vines stamped on their coins. The rabbis referred to it repeatedly in their teachings. It was all throughout their literature. Ezekiel said, we are God's vine planted by the water with branches full of fruit and leaves. And for a while, that's how it went. But then Hosea says, as the vineyards of Israel increased, so did their altars. And as their altars increased, they worshiped other gods. And when this happened, other nations got envious and they attacked the vineyard, Israel. And they tore down the walls. They picked the grapes. They trampled the rest. 
And all of Israel mourned. Why? They said, why have you allowed the pagans to trample your vineyard? Oh God, this is the psalmist. Why, O oh Lord, have you broken down the walls? Why have you let the nations plunder the vineyard that you planted? It is here in this argument between God and his people that Isaiah writes his sermon in chapter 5. And he writes it as a rebuttal to Psalm 80. In Psalm 80, the question the Israelites were asking was why? Why did you tear down the walls and give up your vineyard to the nations? But the question Isaiah will ask is another one. Every preacher has a few sermons that outlive him. When he's done with them, they linger in the consciousness of his people. Isaiah 5 was one of them. Because when Isaiah went to the pulpit, if there was a pulpit that day, he started singing what he called the song of the vineyard. And it went like this. God has a loved one, his vineyard. He dug up the ground cleared the stones, built a wall, put a wine press, and built a watchtower. And then he planted the vineyard with the choicest of vines. And he said to himself, on year three, I'll get the return. But when year three came, the fruit was only wild and sour. There was fruit, but it was wild, untended, uncared for. And then Isaiah proceeded to list four or five things Israel had done in that one sermon to spoil the vine. He said, you are guilty of greed all across your land. Then he said, there is substance abuse or debauchery. You're drunk or high all of the time. Then he said, there is pride and arrogance. You consider yourself exceptional, better than the other nations. Fourth, he said, you're perverting the good and calling it evil. And you've begun to call evil good. You've said normal is abnormal. And you're calling abnormal normal. And five, you are guilty of injustice. That is why God tore down the walls. Now, Israel, to your question, why have I torn down the walls? I ask, why did my vineyard produce only sour grapes? Why has it been so untended? And it is here, at this point in Isaiah's sermon, that you can hear overtones of Jesus' parable. 
instead of coming to seize control of my vineyard and kill all the servants, there is still one more that I have, my son, whom I love very much. I will send him. Surely they will respect him. So in Matthew 21, in Mark 12, in Luke 20, Jesus, and the timing is important here, Jesus goes into the temple that he has just cleansed in the last week of his life. According to Josephus, in his antiquities, there was in the temple a set of stairs just west of the holy place. Toward the top of the stairs, Josephus said, was a large curtain with purple, scarlet, and blue flowers. On both sides of the curtain was a long golden chain. Above the curtain, above the beam, going into the most holy place, was a massive vine full of grapes, all in gold. Josephus says, the wealthy come and bring their gifts, and the metal workers add it to the ornate emblem of Israel's nationalism. Now Jesus stands in the temple telling the people not what will happen. He is telling them what has already happened. For about 24 hours earlier, up the hill on the other side of the Kidron Valley, Jesus has met with his disciples and he's had a conversation about the vineyard. And that conversation is before you now in John chapter 15. And I would like you to turn your attention there. Speaking to his disciples, Jesus says in effect to them, you are the others to whom I will give the vineyard. And he puts it like this. I am the vine. I am the new Israel. No one would have missed it. And you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I remain in you, you will bear fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you remain in me, and if my words remain, abide, dwell, Settle, grow, reproduce. If my words dwell and reproduce in you, then you will bear even more fruit, proving yourselves to be my disciples. You will ask for anything, and the Father will give it to you. And this is why I say, his teaching is not just for the disciples, but for us. We are the new tenants. You are some of the farmers to whom God has given the vineyard. 
Do you see what this means? Some of you, like Jesus' crowd, are still trying to put it together. May I help? Wherever you work, whatever you do, whatever the family that you're raising, you are to think of your jobs not as an institution, but as a vineyard. The metaphor is not institutional. The metaphor is organic. It has to do not with strategy, vision, identifiable outcomes, all of the language that we use in the corporate world. The metaphor for your work is powerful. It has to do with life. What you do in your work is to convey life. You convey the life of the vine into the fruit. And the measure of your success is in the quality of fruit that you produce. Is it wild and is it sour or is it good and fit for the landowner? My friend, Alex Cecilia, reminds me that the vine is not the same thing as the trellis. The trellis supports the vine. The trellis is the structure. It's the organization. It's the policies. It's the numbers. It's everything we do to steady our work. But the vine is the life. And if you stay in your work long enough, you will be tempted as I am to shift your attention from life into structure. And believe that if you have built an impressive trellis, there must somewhere be a vine. You should worry about that. Second, what you are producing is fruit. But the fruit that you're producing is not something you can produce without Jesus. For he said, without me, you can do nothing. And the truth is, people, We all can do a lot of things without Jesus. God knows we have, but we cannot do what he wants us to do in the way that he does it without the spirit of God living in us. The fruit that we are to bear is not success and it isn't achievements. It's not degrees and it isn't profits. It's not the size of the organization or the family or the institution that we're working in. The fruit that we bear is love and joy and peace. It is patience, kindness, goodness, loyalty, and self-control. Those are the marks of what you're growing in your families. 
Lord, in your word. And third, your job is not to produce fruit. Your job is to remain in him. For he said, if you remain in me and I remain in you, you will produce fruit. You can help it. You will be tempted to focus only on producing fruit and to presume that you remain in him. You must turn that around. You must presume you will bear fruit and spend all of your energies remaining in him. For over time, your work and your audience will pull you away from the vine. You will need a conscious daily habit of reattaching yourself to that vine. Because the stronger that link, the better your fruit. Are you still there? And four. Is this four, three, five? I'm just unloading on you guys this morning. The key to remaining is obedience. If you remain in me and my words settle, dwell in you. If you obey my commandments, you will remain in me even as I remain in the Father. You will be as much an extension of my life as I am an extension of his. That's what he said. Those are high orders, church. The trouble with disobedience is not that it stunts the fruit that Jesus wants to produce. The trouble with our disobedience is that it grows other branches. It grows habits, tendencies, and defaults, and dispositions, and it hardens into values, which we defend later. And people, hmm, this is not good. It siphons the life away from the thing that God is trying to do for us, and it puts it all into these distractions. And so number five or four or something, <laughs> you must submit yourself to the pruning. Church, every one of us will be cut. Some of us will be cut off. but the rest of us will be cut up. Because whenever a branch bears fruit, he must prune it. So it bears even more. And this means that God must bring into our lives seasons that are hard and unfair and critical. And our tendency is to get defensive to these things and cry out immediately how unjust and unfair this is. And we are right. 
It is unjust and it is unfair, but God has a way of taking things that hurt us and using them to prune us. So, so rather than ask ourselves, why is this happening? If we asked ourselves what might be possible as a result of what this is happening. Hear me clearly, because some of you have been abused by other people. This does not in any way justify the behavior that other people and things have done to you. It was every bit as wrong as you say it was. The question is, what now? What next? Do you stay there and just repeat the injustices to yourself and let it justify all of these flagrant vines that are growing around you? Or do you say, how might God use this? What might I learn? Even if it's only patience and trust that will help me to be even more fruitful. And six, this is last, I promise. Jesus is offering us a way to tell how fruitful we really are. Our society has messed this up. They have given us a whole nother set of metrics. And we accepted them. And Jesus is offering us a more organic way to evaluate how good our vineyards are are so your family your kids our churches mm, college church the places where you work and the people that you work with what do you see is it love is it joy do you see peace, patience, kindness? Do you see goodness and loyalty growing up in the people you influence? Do you see lives of self-control? In the end, the measure of a branch it's not what it has or what it is it's what it produces in the fruit the measure of your success is not what you've accomplished it's what other people accomplish because of you it's not just what you've become good as that might be it's what others become because of your life. It's as quiet as when we started. Are you still there? Yeah. We've come to the end of my little talk, as they say in some places. I could go out asking you to examine the fruit. I could go out asking you, are you really connected to the vine? Hmm. 
I've decided to go out with a blessing. That'd be all right. Because <laughs> I don't want you to leave heavy and, and downhearted. I want you to leave thinking, hmm, this is a hard teaching. Who can hear it? And then I want you to hear it. And I want you to believe that you are empowered by God's own spirit to transmit life to the people that you work with. At the end of the day, this is all you do. You say, I have a job. No. This is your calling. Your job is a platform to live out your calling. Your family, your kids, and your grandkids, this is your fruit. The kids in our church, in our schools, who come from rough homes, our neighborhoods, These are our vineyards. This is our calling. Remain. And they will grow. Would you stand? Can I read a blessing over you, please? Would it be all right? As we started, it is better for you to hear this as God's own voice to you. Before you were born, I called you. And from birth, I have been mentioning your name. In the shadow of my hand, I have hidden you. I polished you through years and I concealed you but now I say to you you are my servant the one to whom I have given the vineyard I am the vine you are the branch remain in me and I will remain in you you cannot bear fruit by yourself you must remain in the vine but if you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can't do anything. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, well then, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you so that you bear even more fruit to my Father's glory. Now, the Father has loved me. Remain in my love and love one another as I have loved you deeply from the heart for the fruit of the Spirit who is in you is love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, loyalty, gentleness, and self-control. If you bear these virtues in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of me. And you will prove yourself to be exactly what I called you. You are the new tenants of my vineyard. No, you are the branches of the vine. You are my true disciples. The word of the Lord.